In recent years, combat sports have grown exponentially in popularity. Looking at the boundless fame, fortune, and glory surrounding top martial artists, boxers, and fighters alike, it's easy to glamorize these sports and their athletes. This idealization often extends to the combat sports of the past, put forth by literature, television, and films, depicting glorified and honorable warriors beloved by ancient society as legendary heroes. In the case of ancient Rome, however, this romanticization wasn't a perfect reflection of reality for its famed gladiators. So what were the lives of these ancient fighter athletes really like? Contrary to what you may guess, a gladiator would wake up each morning not surrounded by the walls of a sophisticated palace, but enclosed in a dismal cell. The true lives of ancient Rome's gladiators were more complex and harrowing than the stories and myths born from their legacy. To better understand a gladiator's place in Roman society, it's important to examine the strict hierarchy of classes that ancient Romans abided by. Within this system, rulers and the elites close to them enjoyed luxury and respect, while other members of society struggled at the margins. Towards the bottom of this hierarchy, there were those classified as infamia. These stigmatized individuals included convicted criminals, sex workers, actors, and even gladiators and their trainers. Infamia were not given the basic rights that typical Roman citizens possessed. Most gladiators, like any other infamia, were considered disgraceful and untrustworthy by the rest of society, and the word gladiator was considered a particularly sharp insult. Becoming a gladiator was rarely a choice one could make freely in ancient Roman society. In fact, in some cases it was considered a punishment for slaves that were particularly disliked by their masters. Many gladiators began as enslaved men or prisoners of war sold away to a ludus, or gladiatorial school, where they were put through incredibly strict and harsh training rituals. These schools were not unlike prisons. Archaeologists discovered the ruins of one gladiatorial school outside of Vienna, Austria, that contained only one exit, which led to the arena. While the gladiators that attended this school may have had some freedom to come and go from the barracks, they slept in what were essentially jail cells each night. Even for the rare few who entered into the gladiatorial schools willingly, it was usually a choice made out of desperation. Former high-status men who had their reputations ruined or became publicly disgraced could try their hand as a gladiator, and some criminals could work off their sentence with combat. While the majority of gladiators lived and died in shame and essentially anonymous to society, a very select few found success and fame. While the elites of ancient Rome always regarded most gladiators as dishonorable, some gained celebrity status and were even seen as sex symbols. Because of this, there were a small handful of free men who willingly entered into gladiatorial school in hopes to achieve some level of stardom. These free men signed a contract rendering them property and took an oath to endure, to be burned, to be bound, to be beaten, and to be killed by the sword. The few gladiators that did obtain notability made enough of an impact on history to influence pop culture, leading many to generalize their fame. In reality, the majority of gladiators lived their lives in hardship, forced to entertain the masses without much hope of attaining a life that was truly their own. As a noicus, or new gladiator, your morning would begin with waking up locked inside your 16 by 10 foot cell. Since you are new, you would probably be kept in chains for your entire day unless you are actively training. Despite the small space, you may have a roommate who will live and train alongside you. A trainer would come by to unlock your cell so you could begin your day with a meal. Archaeologists believe you would be fed a mainly vegetarian diet and your meals were given special attention to optimize fitness and promote strength. Before your training would begin, your trainers would physically examine you to help decide which type of gladiator you would become. There were two main categories of gladiators and many subcategories, and one would be selected depending on your background and physique. The first category of fighter was the heavily armed gladiator. These fighters benefited from the protection of heavy metal armor during combat. 
but were also slowed down by its weight. One subcategory of heavily armed fighters were the Samnites, who were equipped with a plumed helmet, short sword, long shield, greaves, and visor. There were also the Thracians, who had helmets, greaves, a small round shield known as a buckler, and a scythe-like dagger. Thracians were often pitted against Mermelonis, who were also outfitted with a full set of armor, sword, and shield. A subset of Mermelonis gladiators were Secutoris, who were also heavily armored but featured a helmet in the shape of a fish that encased most of their heads, protecting them but limiting their vision. The second category of fighters consisted of lightly armored gladiators, who weren't as well protected but were fast and agile in the arena. They included the Retiari, who used only a net, trident, and shoulder guard. They often fought against the Secutoris by trying to entangle them in their nets. If you lacked military background, you would likely be made into a Retiari. Lacquery gladiators used lassos to wrangle their opponents. There were also gladiators called the Bestiari that fought unarmed against wild animals, and Wenatores, who hunted animals in the arena. Equites would ride horses around the arena and dismount during combat. And Esidari fought on war chariots. Once this decision was made, your rigorous and specialized gladiator training would begin. Most of your waking moments are spent in the central courtyard of the school, practicing drills and learning new skills under the guidance of your trainers, who are all former gladiators. To practice swings and jabs, you would wield a wooden weapon against a large pole in the courtyard repeatedly. Your armor and equipment would be made heavier than the standard weight to maximize your strength and stamina. You would train alongside other gladiators of the same style and always fight an opposing style. As a result, you likely formed a close camaraderie with your fellow heavily armed or lightly armed gladiators. Sometimes you were permitted to have women visitors in your barracks to keep up morale. If you were lucky, you may take a wife and start a family, but this wasn't the case for everyone. If you exhibited any fear or resisted entering the arena, you were threatened with a hot iron or whip. After winning your first bout, you would no longer be called a noicus, and instead earned the title of veteranus. You and your fellow gladiators would be continuously hired out of the school by event sponsors for your entire fighting career. Your trainers would charge the sponsors a fee for each fight, and you would get a cut of around 20%. If you survived long enough and became skillful enough, you may become a Secundus Palace, or even a Primus Palace, which were labels given to the two best fighters in a school. But more than likely, many of your matches will end in a draw, rather than victory or defeat. Curiously, gladiator battles began as part of a funeral ceremony for noblemen. Men would fight to the death so that the spirit of the nobleman would be accompanied by the fighters in the afterlife. Soon, gladiatorial combat was put on in remembrance of the dead. As the events grew in scope and more money was invested, these bouts became more about public entertainment than a way to honor the deceased. They began to take place in amphitheater structures, such as the famed Roman Colosseum. Inside the amphitheaters, fighting took place in the arena, which derived the name from the blood-soaked sand that spread across the floor. Fights to the death became less common over time as money, resources, and years of effort were invested into gladiators. In fact, if a match did end in death, the trainers would charge the sponsor up to a hundred times the original fee. However, if the gladiator was badly wounded or gave a poor performance, sponsors would be more likely to allow the killing of these unfortunate few, especially if the audience favored it. Sponsors who allowed killings were often seen as generous. Gladiator fights were a grand spectacle and lavish occasion for the public, with bills posted a few days before the event around ancient Roman towns and cities, advertising the type of combat and which fighters would appear. Over time, the events became so expensive that Roman emperors would be the only ones who could afford to be sponsors. The event would commence with a parade of all the participants, adorned in armor and carrying their weapons. Following that, a prelude battle would commence. These were essentially warm-up fights in which wooden swords and javelins were used. Exotic animals like lions would be brought out for the audience to marvel at, and the bestiari and venatores would perform around this time. 
sometimes female gladiators, known as gladiatrices, would perform. But this was seen as more of a novelty than a true contest of skill between women. However, the intermission that took place around lunchtime, typically before the main bouts, was what gave gladiator battles their bloody reputation. During this part of the event, criminals who were condemned to death were publicly executed in the arena. Taken straight from prison to the arena, criminals had no training and stood little to no chance of survival. Sometimes execution was at the jaws of one of the animals. Other times it was by crucifixion or during naval-style battles called nomekia. There were even instances where criminals would battle each other, one armed with a gladius or short sword and the other unarmed, forced to run for his life. This massacre would conclude with two men dressed as Mercury, god of thieves and tricksters, amongst other things, and Charon, the ferryman of the dead, entering the blood-soaked arena. They would go around and stick a hot poker into each corpse or bash them with a hammer to ensure that each criminal was indeed dead. This all took place as spectators would get up to use the restrooms or purchase food or drinks from the many surrounding bars. Finally, with the sound of a trumpet, the main gladiatorial fights would begin. Music would continue to play through each battle, swelling in volume as the action crescendoed. What happened if a gladiator survived through his peak years of fighting and entertainment? It's not known how long a gladiator would fight throughout their lives, but retirement or a chance at freedom most likely came after his best years were behind him. In more rare cases, a gladiator would be granted his freedom by an emperor or sponsor if they displayed what is called virtus. Virtus was a specific virtue in ancient Rome that encompassed exceptional valor, courage, character, and masculinity. These lucky gladiators were awarded a symbolic wooden training weapon called a rudis, along with one last title, rudiarius. A Rudiarius could not become a Roman citizen or possess any of the rights that came with citizenship, but his children could. Many Rudiari would go on to become trainers and earn a living through charging event fees to sponsors and teaching the next generation of gladiators. Others would opt to continue to fight and earn money if their health allowed it, and they would often have bargaining power to negotiate more prize money. One famous gladiator called Flama achieved Rudiarius status four different times, but chose to keep returning to the arena. At the Colosseum's inaugural games, gladiators Priscus and Verus fought so honorably and for so long, the fight was declared a joint victory. Emperor Titus provided them with lavish gifts and honorably discharged them from service. These famous gladiators were particularly successful and their good fortune was not the typical gladiator experience for many. Perhaps the most famous gladiator in history is Spartacus, who was the subject of countless stories and legends throughout the ages. His depiction by Kirk Douglas in Stanley Kubrick's 1960 film of the same name made a lasting impact on modern perceptions of gladiators. Spartacus became renowned not for his fighting prowess in the arena, but his leadership as a rebel fighter, desperate to escape his life as a gladiator. He came from a particularly harsh gladiatorial school that confined its pupils throughout most of the day. Spartacus was brought to the school as a former Roman soldier who was captured and enslaved after deserting the army. After facing immense isolation and torment at the school, he helped lead a revolt of 78 gladiators armed with stolen kitchen knives they were able to overpower the guards and found gladiatorial weapons to fight off the legionnaires sent after them. Spartacus led his group up Mount Vesuvius with the legionnaires close behind, who believed they had them trapped since there was only one path up the mountain. However, Spartacus and the gladiators made makeshift ladders, secretly climbing their way down to the legionnaires' camp, where they launched a surprise attack. Soon Spartacus and his gladiator rebel army were joined by thousands of revolting slaves in a campaign known as the Third Servile War before he was eventually killed in battle. The true story of Spartacus sheds light on the plight of countless enslaved gladiators within the Roman Empire whose tragic and brutal lives were quickly forgotten by spectators and lost to history. <laughs>